16. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Next verse is Matthew 25, 21. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Next verse is Matthew 25, 23. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. Is that supposed to be replaced? Okay. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Matthew twenty five thirty. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's our scripture reading. Something twice, what does that mean? Things that you've done. We thank you for the spirit that empowers us. And Father, we pray that we can tap into that spirit and we can truly <coughs> walk by faith. Faith that can give us the courage to face all things. Faith that can move mountains, Lord, and face anything in our lives. Just thank you for loving us, for loving us so much that you would sacrifice your son for us. Bless the reading of your word today and the scripture, Lord, and just bless us as we are traveling and with our families and friends. And we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. So if you didn't notice, that verse was identical. And they weren't random. They were in order telling a story. that Jesus was talking about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he told twice, well done, my good and faithful servant. But if you look, that last verse wasn't so nice, was it either? So I looked around this morning and looked and said, oh, there's no visitors here today. Good. Because Jesus taught some really nice things that we like to hear. And then he taught some things that are pretty tough and kind of cut to the quick. Though. And it wouldn't be my job if I just tossed them, taught the nice, fluffy things with it. So today's sermon, like Mike said, is it going to be... What did you say? Sweet, long, uh, short, short and sweet. sweet. I said, no, it's going to be rough and long. So, if you've got your Bibles, we are going to be in Matthew some, mainly chapter 25. But the reason that I wanted to preach on this was Sarah convicted me to preach on that. Because last week, I said that I gave you some homework. And she did her homework. She was looking at it and stuff and said, these are some tough verses. And that's why I wanted you to look at them. They were from Luke 12, verses 42 through 48. This world today, especially in the United States, we tend to water down Christianity. We don't want to say the things that can be offensive to others. But the gospel message is a whole. If we don't tell people, hey, that you should behave this way, then why are we surprised when we have Christians who don't act like Christians? We profess one thing with their mouths, but believe in their hearts something totally different. I thank God daily that I have this church. And I thank you all for your gifts that you have given Sherry and I this month. If you didn't know it's Pastor Appreciation Month and you have one more week, <laughs> I have been overwhelmed by the love that I have here. But, there's that contradictory word. I knew it already, guys. I know how much you love and appreciate both of those. We have been overwhelmed and we thank you. Um, I didn't take this position lightly. I didn't want this position in God's eyes. But he said, I am the one telling you to be obedient. I talked about that before. And I said, okay, it makes no sense to me, but I can be obedient. I can walk by faith. At least I can try to walk by faith. And like I said, that means shepherding the church. That means teaching all of God's Word. That means teaching even the tough ones. And not just mentioning those scriptures, but teaching them. So you may not agree with everything I have to say. And you don't have to. Go examine it. That's why I said for you to examine it. But when Jesus' words are tough, we need to look at those words so that we understand them. I hear many times where people say, well, you know, I don't know what heaven's going to be like if we're going to be preaching on heaven soon. But it doesn't matter as long as I get there. Well, it does matter because the Bible teaches us things about heaven. And we are supposed to be good stewards of what God has given us. 
we do work for rewards. So today I'm going to talk about Jesus' words, not Paul's words, not Peter's words, but guess what? They don't contradict each other. Jacob read me an article this week too that kind of told me that I was on the right path. It was an article from a Christian author, a Christian artist, who said, well, I, don't, I think America worships the Bible too much. We need to worship Jesus. We look at the Bible, and there's no way that all those words are right, that they're, they're God's words. We hear that today. So we pick and choose what we want as a result. This is 100% God's Word. It doesn't contradict. Any of the things that you see online or that people say, that say this passage contradicts that passage, I can give you an argument just the same where it doesn't. So we can't prove anything we do like that. We weren't there when Jesus was there and spoke and said, let there be light. We can't go back and prove that. We have to walk by faith with what it says. But we can look at the outcome of this creation and say, this didn't come from, from non-intelligence. This didn't come from something unordered. This was orderly in design. And the more that we see, I heard a thing about the Hubble telescope this week, that now they think there's 25% more stars than what they thought before, which is already some un vastly number that I can't even comprehend. So the more and more that we get knowledge, the more and more that we see how amazing, powerful, and loving God is when we study His Scriptures. But this, art, this artist was saying, I take just Jesus' words. I don't take Paul's words or Peter's words because they weren't Jesus' words. Well, first of all, whoever this artist is, I don't even know, so I'm not, just, I'm not saying their name. Paul's words and Peter's words were Jesus' words. They imitated Jesus and tried to be like Jesus and they found upon his words. They don't contradict. And if he wanted to look at Jesus' words, and he was saying that just because Jesus didn't teach on a particular topic, which was his sin, so he was trying to justify that, just in the days of the Pharisees, where Jesus spoke to them and said, you're taking the law and you're twisting it for your own use. Your hearts are far from me, you hypocrites vipers. And he was doing the same thing. He was saying, Jesus didn't teach about this, so I'm not going to say that this is what Jesus meant. Well, if he looked at Jesus' words, Jesus' words were very true. They were very severe. He said that a murderer would be condemned. But he also said right after that, and that, this is in Matthew, uh, he said that a person who was angry with their neighbor would face judgment just the same. He said that if a man, that we knew that adultery was a sin, but if a man had looked at another woman with lust in his heart, he had already committed adultery. So Jesus taught some pretty tough things. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't say one thing and mean something else. <clears throat> Jesus was offensive at times. So if I offend you today, remember they're Jesus' words, okay? Because I don't like to offend anybody, but I'm not up here for a popularity contest either. I'm up here to teach the Word of God. <clears throat> when we had our VBS, Vacation Bible School, some of the counselors were talking, and one of the counselors said, you know, Jesus was all about love. I don't know why we can't just preach love. And I'm like, we do preach love. That is what we preach. But I said, our actions don't necessarily go along with our words, do we? Do we? And they said, well, I don't think Jesus really taught things offensively. And I'm like, have you read your Bible? I said, because if you look at it, Jesus has. I said, what do you think nailed him to a tree? And then that started the conversation up and they realized what I was saying. And we looked at some passages and everything. We like to remember John 3.16, but we don't like to remember Luke 9.23. What's not Luke 9.23? You guys should know by now. Take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Because that one's a little more offensive than John 3.16, which everyone can quote. Well. <clears throat> so this artist, in my opinion, and I shouldn't name names for sure, he would be one that Jesus would point out as being a hypocrite. You won't find that word in the Old Testament, but you'll find a concept. The concept is a godless rebel, like Nimrod. One who chooses to say there, I don't, if there is a God, I'm not going to follow him. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. The New Testament word comes from the Greek word hypocrisis, which is an actor performing a role on the stage. So Jesus is taking and combining that concept of a godless rebel with an actor that performs on the stage when he's talking primarily to the Pharisees and the other teachers of the law. 
He is saying, you're wearing a mask. You <clears throat> imitate it. You're playing a game. You say that you're righteous. You say that you obey the law. But really, you're twisting the law for your own purposes. Your heart's far from this. You're a hypocrite. And the place that He has established for hypocrites is the place that He designed for the devil and, and the demons. He didn't design that for any man to go to, but He does say that that's their destination. These people wear a mask and pretend to be something that they are not. They act like they are religious when they are the exact opposite. They're far from it. Our Bible says if we read it and understand it, that if we believe in our heart and then confess with our mouth that we're saved. But so much of the world today, we see a confession with our mouth, but we don't see the heart. The problem is, is we can't see the heart. But Jesus gave us something to tell us for that too. He told us how we can tell. We don't need to see the heart. And we'll get into that in, in just a minute. <clears throat> but Jesus taught words that eventually got Him nailed to a tree. Now that was God's purpose and God's plan so that we could be saved. But He didn't just teach words that were just all nice and we can all just get along with it. So we're going to look at Luke 12 a little bit more today, 42 through 48, but we're not going to get to it because we're not going to quite make it that far. <clears throat> Remember, you don't have to agree, and these are Jesus' words that I'm going to be reading. They're read in red in your Bible if your Bible has red. But see, that Christian artist, I think when he said, I don't want to take any of the word besides Jesus, I think this was one verse he wanted to throw out. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is alive and active. Or if you have King James, it says quick and powerful. It's living. It's not lifeless and dead. It's li living. It has the power of God who created and spoke and universes came into play. And it has the power to condemn a man to hell or save a man and bring him to heaven. The Gospel is the power of salvation to all men who believe. It is sharper than any two, any double-edged sword. A double-edged sword has two cutting blades. So when it's thrust in, it cuts. When it pulls out, it cuts. It cuts. That's why sometimes the word sting. It cuts and penetrates <coughs> even to the dividing soul and spirit. Our minds and even our spirits, our conscience, to the joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of what? The heart of you, not the mouth. Not our mind, but our heart. It teaches us right and wrong in the sight of God, which is not a mystery to those who have believed already. Scripture tells us that. It's not a mystery anymore. It teaches us His will so that we can be obedient to His will. That we can understand that we are a creation, not the Creator. So if we're a creation, we are designed and created by the Creator for whatever purpose the Creator intended. To bring glory and honor to Him and bring praise to Him. And like I said last week, we can worship and we can praise and we can sing and we can do all that in heaven, but we can't tell an unsaved person about Jesus Christ anymore in heaven. So that has to be a primary objective of us today. We can't argue that fact because we can't do that once we go on to heaven. The Word of God is Jesus put on paper every part of it, not just the Gospel messages. I wonder how He takes the gospel messages when he reads something and says, well, that can't be true because we've lost it in translation or whatever. We have it. Study. The Word of God today that we have is just like the text that we had before. There might be some punctuation differences and stuff, but the words are still the same. That's when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. It just was something that just laid waste to everything we'd ever seen. It should have shut up the opposition, but it didn't because the opposition is always going to be there. The Word of God is the same that it was intended to be, and it is 100% accurate, and every word is profitable. Our scripture this morning was from Matthew 25. So, we'll read first of Matthew 24. The last verse of Matthew 24, verse 51 says, He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place for the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you remember the words from those words are very similar. Those aren't words that we like. We want to say, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? How can there be eternal punishment? But we want to believe, on the other hand, that we want eternal salvation and an eternal home in heaven. 
We want that, but we say in our mind, how can there be an eternal hell? There can be because God is a righteous and holy God, and He does everything to prevent a person from going to hell, even sacrificing His own Son. So the verses that we're going to read, or the verses that were there, we read a, a, a thing about the Master who has gone away. And He has servants. And He's left those servants behind to take care of His affairs in the place that He left from. This earth. Scripture tells us that we're aliens and foreigners here. It tells us that we're ambassadors. <coughs> Jesus has left His servants behind. Those that believe in Him are servants. We learn that from Paul. It's a dulios, a slave, one who has his, no rights of his own. That he voluntarily gives them up to the Master to serve the Master's purpose, the Master's will. <coughs> and Jesus says twice, Well done, my good and faithful servant. But in that verse 30, he said, throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's pretty clear. We've got a good outcome that we want to hear and we've got a bad outcome that we kind of shy away and don't talk about. It. A very strong statement of Jesus that we might just skip over, but like I've said before, every word of the Bible is pertinent. It wasn't written there just so we could skip over it. The statement is about servants also. You can read this and see if you see anything different. But this is about servants. Well, a servant is someone who belongs to the master already, right? We're not talking about an outsider. We're not talking about an unbeliever, if you apply it spiritually. We're talking about someone who is a servant of the master. And the outcome of a bad servant is that he'll be thrown away, that he'll be discarded. He'll be cut in two even. Two passages in Scripture say that he will be cut in two. This is the servant, not an outsider. Then it says that there, there are good and faithful and wise servants. So if there are good and faithful and wise servants, then there has to be servants that aren't good and faithful and wise. Guess what? We're not all good, faithful, and wise, whether we think we want to be or not. So we need to examine our own lives. And there are some pretty serious differences between the good and bad servants. And we're going to look at Luke 12, 42 to 48 later. We're not going to get into that as much today. That gives you a chance to do more homework on it, doesn't it? Okay? So we say there are good and bad servants. And all throughout Scripture we see that Jesus pays accordingly to your words. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about a performance appraisal here. The Master's gone away. He's left you in a position. He's left you with the powers of God Himself in the Spirit that resides inside of you to accomplish anything and everything that you face with one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, to be a light to this world to tell others about Jesus Christ. So when He returns, what would His performance appraisal be of you as a servant? You might want to look at that now. That's what some business owners do is they, they let you do a performance appraisal yourself before they come and actually give you a performance appraisal. Gives you another chance to look at it yourself and examine. Am I a good, faithful, and wise servant? Charles Stan Dr. Charles Stanley says this, if you and I are to make the impact in life upon others that we should, if we are to fulfill God's purpose and plan for our life, if we're to reap the maximum blessings that God has prepared for us, we, too, must develop the spirit of a servant. And our actions must be the actions of a servant. A servant is one who realizes that Jesus is not only our Savior, but He is the Master of our life. Any unwillingness or resistance to serve others in His name is an act of rebellion. What is rebellion? Sin. Direct disobedience to God. That's why Paul said so much when we're studying Romans, that he says, I'm a slave. I'm set apart for the gospel message of Christ. I long to preach the gospel to you. I am not ashamed, for the gospel is the power of salvation to those who believe. And then he says that you will take on righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, not because you're worthy, but because of what God did for you through Jesus, who is worthy. Or you will continue to stay in your unrighteousness, and your unrighteousness will yield an eternal damnation. The words are clear. 
Romans 1.5, Paul says, Through Him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith. Not He didn't say to, to act this way part of the time and that a different way another time or do this and that. He said obedience. Obeying every word of God. That comes from faith for His name's sake. Later on in Romans, Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Paul writes, Do you know... Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Sometimes we might want to say, oh, I'm not a slave to anything. Well, you are a slave. You're either a slave to God, you're either a servant to God, or you're not. And that's irregardless of whether you belong to the Master or not. We're not talking about salvation again. If you are a servant, you are saved. But you still can be a good servant or a bad servant. If you are a slave, you belong to Jesus. But do you realize that and do you give your life to Him? Or do you fight His will? Do you say, I'll be your slave when it's okay with me. When I've done this or that. And Anything I'm saying, I'm pointing fingers at myself. And I'm not saying this because there's a problem in this church. I am so grateful for this church. I'm just preaching God's Word. And they convict me just as much. So don't think you're not a slave or servant. You are. And you obey one or the other, like Paul says. Regardless of who you belong to, you're obeying one or the other. So if there are two masters then we can take that back to reality, what Jesus is teaching. It's God and the devil. Plain and simple, right? So you're serving and obeying one or the other. That's why a Christian can be a Christian but still be caught up into some terrible sin. It didn't say he's not saved. But he's still being controlled, which Scripture tells us we have power over that, by another master than the one who's called him to serve him. So there are good, there are good and faithful servants, and there are bad servants. We better hope there's not just good and faithful servants, right? I would fall short. So there are good and faithful servants, and there are bad servants. So we just need to figure out what are we going to be. The power of God is already there. Am I going to be a bad one? Do I need to do a performance appraisal and see, or am I doing what God has called me to do? And if I do that. Wow, look at the things that I'm going to be rewarded with. Why would I want to try to fight the kingdom of heaven for all eternity to have this little kingdom here on earth? Why would I want to not know that the sun is shining just past these clouds? I saw it sharing too. I saw it driving in. I said, you know, if, if I had time, I'd like to run up to the top of Roman and just take a picture. Because if you've ever been up on the mountain and seen the fog over the whole valley, you're totally in a different world than the people that are down there in that valley. You see all the glory of God when they're covered in darkness. But you just have to see that light. And you have to have faith and you have to be obedient if you're going to see that. <clears throat> Jesus is looking for good, faithful, wise, obedient servants. That's who He put in place. That's the Scriptures we read about this morning. And if I'd added one more verse in sequence, I'd have added verse 41. We made it through verse 40. Verse 41 in Matthew 25 says, Then He will say to those on the left, Depart from Me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now this follows <coughs> Jesus' teachings. There's a series of parables here. This follows His teaching of sheep and goats. Well, those are two different things. But sometimes you'll find them in the same pasture, eating the same thing, acting and behaving the same way, even the goat might think he is a sheep, but guess what? He's not. We used to have a bull with our horses. You could not separate that bull from our horses. He thought that was his herd. He thought he was a horse. He'd never seen another bull since he was just a little bitty baby. He thought that was his herd, but he wasn't a horse. I eat him now. I don't eat my horses. He had a different purpose. But if you would have asked him, if he could have told you, I'm a horse. This is my herd. So it doesn't matter what he thought, and it doesn't matter how he behaved, he was still something different. 
I have a hard time telling that, but my wife is good about that. She can go out in the flower bed and she can say, that's not a weed, don't pull it up. Like, How can you tell that? It's this big. But she can tell that. She can go to the grocery store and she can tell me which cantaloupe to buy because it's ripe. And she can tell me which ear of corn to buy without even pulling the husk back because it's full. I can't do that. But God knows the man's heart. There is no disguising him. There's no husk you can put over him. And you can act however you want to and say whatever you want to, but He knows your heart. He knows who are His sheep or not. <clears throat> if you keep reading on in verse 46, Jesus says, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now this isn't talking about His servants. This is talking about the difference between fakers and the real thing. Saints and ain'ts. Sheep and goats. But there is a destination for those who don't believe. And thank goodness that but is in here that there's a destination for those who do believe. But we need to realize that we don't want to just get there by the skin of our teeth. That we do want to hear that phrase, well done, my good and faithful servant. That we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That we carry His righteousness. But that we still should be longing for and working for the Master who was away, who has put us in charge, who has left us behind to carry out His duty on earth. And He came so that men might be saved. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world from their sins. And that's what He left His servants in charge of. <clears throat> Here's how Jesus told us that we can examine and look at those who are genuine or not. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Jesus has just talked about a parable of trees and their corresponding fruits. And that parable ends in verse 20 by saying, Thus, by their fruits, you will recognize them. Look at your fruits. Not look at your neighbor's fruits. Look at your fruits. What kind of fruits are you bearing? He didn't say we might be able to recognize them. He says we will be able to recognize them. So even those who look like they're doing fruits, if we examine really good, we can see that that fruit's rotten. Or we can see that it's really not the fruit that we thought it was. It's that wheat, it's imposter, whatever it is. Because he says we will be able to tell. He gave us that for our benefit, not for his. Because he knows a man's heart. He doesn't need to know. So he gave that for us so that we can determine false prophets. So we can determine those who are Christians, not who profess to be Christians. In verse 15, it had said, watch out because we should be on guard so that we don't fall into false teachings. So that we do examine ourselves, not judge others, but examine ourselves and say, what are my motives? How am I serving? What does my fruit show? Am I a good and faithful servant? So Jesus knows their heart, so He doesn't need to recognize them. And He knows His servants. Those who are good and faithful and those who are not so good and faithful. He doesn't need any way to tell other than a man's heart. What is your heart focused on? Scripture's clear about that. It says we build up treasure wherever our heart is focused. It says that we can't serve two masters. Our heart is what makes a difference. <clears throat> the next words of Matthew 7 are not from the parable. They're word spoken to the crowd. And this crowd is a big crowd that has followed Jesus. And this is His first sermon that He's teaching in Matthew. So He didn't start off His teaching with drawing people in and saying, let me give you this gospel of prosperity so that you'll like this and that. He was blunt from the beginning. He said, if you want to be My disciple, here's what you're going to have to do and it's tough. And if you're going to follow in My footsteps, you're not going to be able to do it. But I'm going to send the Spirit to help you be able to do it because you're never going to be able to do it on your own. So if we go back and look at the first verses, the first chapters of Matthew, Jesus' words aren't spoken until chapter 3, where he tells John the Baptist, you need to, you need to baptize me, because John didn't want to baptize him. And then in chapter 4, we see his words to Satan, where Satan is trying to tempt him. And then we see in verse 17 of chapter 4, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is coming near. The very first words he said aren't fluffy words. Repent means that I'm wrong about something in the first place. That I need to change my way of thinking. 
Well, either I'm humble and I see that, or that kind of offensive to me, isn't it? Because what's wrong with me? I'm not a murderer. Oh, but I've been mad at my neighbor, haven't I? So I'll have to face judgment just the same. And he goes down into verse verse 23, and this says, these are Jesus' words. This word continues on. Says, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And he healed them. Large crowds from, Ga from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. <clears throat> Evidently, they paid no attention to repent, did they? They just came because they wanted a Savior that would provide for their wants and needs. But see, Jesus came as a servant. He gave up heaven and He served His creation to the very end till He died for them. That's the example He set forth. Even the night before He died, He said, I'm washing feet, setting up an example so that you can do this. What a lowly task that was for the lowest of servants. But that's the example that He was putting forth. But crowds were growing here. <coughs> so He taught in these parables, teaching. And He taught directly some too. The very next words that Jesus said in chapter 4 are dute o piso mu. You know what those are, right? Come and follow after me. That means that I leave behind whatever's holding me on. I come towards Jesus and then I follow after Him. That's what He was telling this crowd, but this crowd did not understand this. They like the fluffy feel good. So if you go to chapter 5 and you look at chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, if your Bible has red letters, they're all red. And if you study those letters, uh, those words, some of them are quite offensive. You read in chapter 5, verse 1, though, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he came up on the mountainside and sat down. He didn't avoid them, he started preaching to them. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So he's teaching to the disciples and to, and to the crowd. The difference? is those who choose to follow after Him that don't. Those who choose not to follow after Him goes in one ear and out the other, right? Because they think they like Jesus. They want to be associated with Jesus. But when it comes up to denying yourself and following after Him daily, taking up a cross, they don't want to do that. If you look at the end of that section, Matthew 8, verse 1, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed Him. It looks like it even grew. It looks like Derek is large as a there in Matthew 1. Looks like the crowds got even bigger because they saw the miracles and things that Jesus did. But they didn't want to follow Him with their heart. So back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 said, Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Then Jesus continues, This is not in a parable. This is words to that crowd that we're talking about. Verses 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. I'm not going to concentrate on those verses. You can study those verses. They be for another day. It doesn't say anything about salvation or anything else here. It says the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do not pro did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me that's a tough passage. There are those that look like they have fruit. He just said we recognize them by their fruit just before this. Does this passage negate the previous passage he said? No, it does not. We can examine the fruits and see if they're genuine or not, especially in our own lives, but we can do it in the lives of others also so that we don't fall prey to false doctrines and things in this world that are common in this day, just as common as they were in Jesus' days. The teachers of the law in Jesus' days were primarily corrupt. So why would the church in general be any different in the world today? There are still going to be good and faithful servants and there are going to be bad servants. And we should be able to recognize them. Jesus is our Master. He has gone away. He has left His servants behind. He's left them in charge of their kingdom. 
When he said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, he meant that very day if you chose to believe. We're living in the kingdom of God right now. That's not when we get to heaven. It has started now. We are supposed to be stewards. We're supposed to be good, faithful, and wise servants. We're supposed to be ambassadors. We're supposed to be aliens to this world with not the thought of building up things in this world that will serve me. But we're supposed to serve others. To tell them about Jesus Christ. So some servants are fake. Some servants are true. Some servants that are true, some are good, some are bad. Luke 12, 42-48 was in answer to Peter's question. Jesus has been teaching all through Luke 12, and in verse 41, Peter says, is this for us? Because this is some pretty hard teaching, or is this for everyone here because there's a crowd here? And Jesus is answering, we'll read the Scripture again, and you can take it home and think about it. The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the Master puts in charge of His servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the Master finds doing so when He returns. Truly I tell you, He will, he, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. That's when He returns, right? But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and he, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on the day when he does not expect him in an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the unbelievers. The servants who know the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now we'll get into that deeper later. But he's talking to his servants. I want you to realize that. And there are good and bad, and there's a terrible outcome. If you're thrown away into hell, that's the most terrible. But I don't want to get beat and whipped either. So think about that when you're, you're studying and meditating on this. And we'll, we'll get into it a little further. What I want to point out in closing is there are two different words for wages in the New Testament. One is obsoneon. You find it in Romans 6.23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Each person has done wrong, and the wage that they deserve is death. Eternal separation from God. Eternal punishment, not just separation. Salvation or condemnation. And in this passage, we know that we can either accept and believe on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from our heart, not believe in our mind, not just confess with our mouth, but believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, and we will be saved. We will inherit the kingdom of heaven. The other word is mythos. In 2 Peter 2.13, you read, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. The NLT reads this way, their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and stain among you. They delight in a deception even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Now, I'm not getting into those verses either just to know that there's a difference between wages. And all of us deserve the wages for the work that we do. A servant is paid by his master. Whether it's just food and lodging or he actually gets a paycheck. And Jesus says plainly when He comes back that He will come back and reward. That second word, misthos, is also translated as reward. Our rewards or our wages are based on what we do with what God has given us. Whether we live a life that honors God, whether we live a life as a good and faithful and wise servant. And so much of this world today says it doesn't matter. I'm saved and I know it, so I've got it all taken care of. 
That's a deception and a lie from Satan. I don't know if you're a goat or a sheep. I don't know if you're a good or a bad servant. All I can do is do a performance of praise for on myself and answer, do I truly believe in my heart? If I do, I'm a servant. If I am a servant, what has God called me to do and serve? He's given me the power to do it. Am I going to be a good and wise, faithful servant? And I'm not doing it or not doing it based on the whipping or anything else that might be the outcome. I'm doing it out of love. So I know that it's genuine. So I ask you today, the Bible teaches plainly what Jesus says. His words aren't easy. They are words for all mankind to be saved. And for those that do say that they will follow after Him, will they do it? Are they genuine? Jesus has left His servants behind to live a life that they should live, to proclaim the Gospel message, to be good stewards of all that He has given you. And these are tough things. We'll take that one, good steward of all that He's given you. We're the top elite of this world. What do you do with the riches that you have in this world? Do you accumulate them for your own retirement? Retirement's not a biblical concept. Or do you walk by faith? God says that He provides for the birds and they don't store up. Why do we worry about storing up treasures on this earth when we need to store up treasures in heaven? Are we being watchful and ready are we wise and faithful servants? Because there is a day coming that we should be looking forward to. And when that day comes, Jesus will pay the wages or rewards that are due to each and every one. I'm not talking about the great white throne judgment here yet either. I'm just talking about what He says to this, His servants. So how will He repay you? Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. Lord, I thank You for the words that are hard. I might find them offensive, Lord, but help them convict me and bring me to my knees that I fall prostrate before You. That I love You with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my body, all of my mind. And that I serve You as a good, faithful, and wise servant. Lord, thank You for this church that You've given me. Thank You for the love that they have. And Lord, I promise that I'll do everything with them, as Paul said, that they provide me just as much encouragement. That we will serve together to make a difference in this world, to make a difference in our community, and to reach out, to stand firm in this time where we don't even know where our country's headed. But here in Springs of Living Water, we'll stand firm and tell others of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this body. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the love that you have given to us. Help us to be faithful and true to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.